Welcome, everyone. It's a great honour to welcome you to Brazier's Park today. We're always pleased to see new faces particularly, and if your face is not new, we like it just as much. And welcome to, to this rather beautiful room, and above all, to our speaker today, Chris Rhodes. Chris is an international uh, academic. He, I know, will be very um, aware of the veracity of everything that he is going to tell us. And I think I'm right in saying that in this community, which is very much dedicated to seeking solutions and alternatives, this particular subject will be very apposite. So, welcome and enjoy. Thank you, Chris. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me to uh, give uh, this year's uh, place to lecture. In fact, last year's was the first opportunity uh, I had to come to uh, Brazier's, um, invited by my friend over there, Alan Clark, uh, who I know from Transition Town, Reading. Now, this is based on a lecture I gave to the Linnaean Society of London quite recently, and it's a really quite broad church, the oil supply, um, biodiversity, the changing climate, um, really the whole lot. And the reason I, I use the word changing climate, not climate change, is to um, allude not just carbon in the atmosphere, global warming, and uh, the consequences of that, but the fact that we are in the midst of a climate changing in all kinds of respects. Those I've just alluded to, uh, our economic system, shaky as uh, it is, and really a whole uh, host of things of which these are uh, merely uh, symptoms of the fact we are getting through our resources too quickly, too carelessly, and if we don't uh, get away from our resource uh, depletion, well, uh, our resources are going to get away from us. So that's really uh, the, the basis of this talk. So what I want to talk about, first of all, is the, the global oil supply. You can see um, the, uh, the black bar on the left-hand side. That is the, uh, the world production of crude oil. And clearly it uh, has the lion's share um, as an energy source of all the uh, energy used by humans on Earth. Uh, very close to that is uh, our use of uh, coal and uh, natural gas in a uh, close third place and then about five or six percent each uh, nuclear and hydro power and on the, the right hand side the little guy a couple of percent that is uh, renewable energy basically it's solar and, and wind energy so you can see that basically we get more than 80 percent of our energy from the fossil fuels at the moment and a couple of percent uh, from renewables and nuclear and hydro uh, somewhere in the middle. Oil is a very uh, specific and particular material. Uh, when you just compare energy sources like this, it almost implies, well, okay, we run a bit short of oil, we can use a bit more coal or something like that. But uh, oil, as I say, is, is rather specific, has a high energy density, it can be refined, that's to say distilled into liquid fuels. And really, it's not just that uh, practically all the world's transportation relies on, on uh, crude oil, but really practically everything else that we do. And it's pouring this, uh, this lifeblood, this uh, supply of oil into global civilization that maintains it. So any issue over the, uh, the supply of oil flowing into civilization is going to have uh, profound consequences. Now this you might call the good old days. This is the Humphreys Jones giant gusher, which certainly did what it says on the tin, uh, drilled out 100 years ago or thereabouts in Texas. And, uh, well, why do I call it the, uh, the good old days? Well, because all you had to do uh, in those uh, times, before about 1930, was to drill a hole in the ground. And basically, for the amount of energy uh, contained in one barrel of oil, or that equivalent, you got 100 barrels out, or thereabouts. That's like investing a quid and getting 100 quid back. Really good return, except you don't get 100 now. Globally, you get less than 20. You go to fracking. Well, you're down below 10, uh, depending on where you're actually doing these operations. Go to heavy oils, bitumen from the tar sands. You might be down to three when you include the upgrading costs. 
So what's happened is we've got through much of the, the easily got and easily processed oil. So to maintain that overall flow of uh, what you might generally call crude oil into a global civilization requires working on much more expensive to get and more difficult to process materials. And that's really where we are now. So the good old days are over and uh, we're now in uh, rather leaner times. So the, the production of oil, uh, the statistic is we produce something like 30 billion barrels of oil every year. I can't imagine what 30 billion barrels of oil or 30 billion anything actually looks like, but it's clearly an absolutely astronomical quantity. And that translates to 84 million barrels a day or a thousand barrels a second. Every second we get through a thousand barrels of oil or thereabouts. That's what it takes to keep this, this going, that level of flow of crude oil into civilization. The major producers of crude oil are Saudi and Russia, and between them they produce something like a quarter of the world's oil supply. Now oil is a very various material. Uh, you hear the term uh, lice oil, that means it's basically very freely flowing. It's almost like, like uh, cooking oil. Now the heavy oil isn't necessarily liquid at all. It's like the black stuff on the road outside. So there's a very various um, set of materials that, that are uh, described under the label of crude oil. Uh, sweet oils, they're good, they're easy to process, they're very low in sulfur. Um, the sour oils, uh, they're much higher in sulfur and it's much more costly and energy intensive. You've got to clean all that sulfur out or it would corrode the inside of your oil refinery. And the light sweet oils are best to uh, convert into uh, petrol and there are large quantities uh, left in, in the Middle East, other places too, but uh, the Middle Eastern nations are sitting on quite a bit of it. Uh, this is a, uh, an exhibit uh, from the Norwegian Museum of Science and Technology in Oslo. And you can see on this wheel um, there are different uh, crude oil samples identified by the, um, the uh, names on the, on the right, some of which refer to Norse gods. But the, the whole point of this is that some of these are, are light in colour, some dark. As you turn the wheel, some of them just flow to the bottom of the tube, others more or less stay where they are because they're so uh, high in viscosity. And you don't have to drill very far apart in terms of distance to recover totally different kinds of material uh, because they contain different molecules. They're really uh, rather different uh, chemical materials. So the big question is how much oil is there remaining? Well, much of the oil that's left um, contains a lot of sulfur, that's uh, the sour kind, and it turns out it's the heavy oils that tend to be um, heavy in, in their sulfur content. So you've got the Orinoco belt in Venezuela which has 500 billion barrels or something like that, some huge quantity of oil there. But not all of it is recoverable. Uh, you hear other statistics like there's another 500 billion or who knows what uh, barrels of oil to be got out of shale in America. And well, only a small proportion of that, a few percent, is actually likely to be uh, recoverable. This is the difference between a resource and a reserve. Um, a resource is basically everything you think or hope might be in place. But, thank you. Yeah. But a reserve is what is actually not only technically, but economically recoverable. And because the oil price has crashed at the moment, then the, the oil reserves globally have shrunk to an almost all time low because much of what is there is not economically recoverable at the time of the moment. So it's all tied into the oil price. Now, shale oil. That's the uh, term that you read in the media for oil that's produced from shale mostly, uh, limestone as well sometimes, but through fracking. But oil shale, um, that's often not shale, but it's not even oil. It's a material called kerogen, and it's immature oil. If that had been stuck in the ground where it was hot enough by geology, it would have been broken down into something we're more familiar with, a, a kind of liquid material. So if you want to process this into oil, then you've got to heat it up to about 500 degrees centigrade. It takes a huge amount of energy. And in a nutshell, you probably wouldn't get much uh, more energy from burning the oil than it took you to heat it up to get it out in the first place. And that's why there's been no serious commercial uh, oil shale industry. There probably never will be. But really, knocking on from this, as I say, it's not only that the whole of the world's transportation is reliant on crude oil, but absolutely everything. Uh, computers, cell phones, you know, it's a challenge to look around a room, sort of feel around yourself and try and find something.
that doesn't depend on oil at, at some level, at some point. So it really is the, the raw material for civilization as we know it. And most chillingly, I think, that without oil and natural gas for, for nitrogen fertilizers, uh, agriculture, as we know it, just couldn't exist. And this is the, um, the slide, the image, basically, that the, um, the poster was uh, based on. And it really is significant um, when you start to look at uh, what this is actually about. It's a real poster child for the unsustainability of modern industrialized agriculture for a number of reasons. Okay, well, for one thing, uh, you need the oil to uh, be cracked into diesel to, to fuel the tractors and the combine harvesters. And of course, um, when the food is, is produced and harvested, it's not just eaten there, it's moved around nations around the entire world. So you've got this huge dependency on the, the global food system, on oil. Another point here was at one time, this was actually a rainforest, this is um, a field of uh, soybeans being grown in Brazil. And so, uh, basically, because they want the land to, to grow um, monoculture crops on, they clear the rainforest in various ways by setting fire to it or by uh, dragging uh, very heavy chains through uh, between a couple of tractors and tearing the trees out of the ground. Of course, this does the, the ground no good at all. And you can see this array of uh, mighty uh, machines uh, doing their work. But what you can see they're doing, all this dust that's been thrown up, that's actually the topsoil being broken up. And these are monoculture crops with growing seasons um, as they are. And of course that ground is left exposed. And very often during the winter, when the erosive forces of wind and water are at their most forceful. And so after a few years, it's necessary to move on, get rid of a bit more rainforest, and it just goes on and on and on. Uh, soil erosion, as I'll get into uh, in the second uh, part of the lecture, is really one of the, uh, the greatest problems facing humanity because we have growing populations and yet the quality of the land is uh, declining continually uh, due primarily to, to soil erosion. Okay, so the global situation, uh, you can identify 98 oil producing countries, um, the, the green uh, chart at the top, but more than half of those uh, the red ones in the, in the bottom chart, they're past their peak in oil production. And roughly speaking, uh, the decline in conventional oil production across the world is about 3 or 4% uh, per year. Now that means, uh, putting it uh, more simply, that we need to find a new Saudi Arabia's worth of production every 3 or 4 years. And if you're trying to fill that hole effectively, um, unidentified projects, this is euphemistically described as on the, the slide here, but that's a big hole that you need to fill um, from unconventional sources, like drilling in deeper and deeper water, like fracking shale, like uh, processing bitumen, all these more difficult uh, ways of trying to maintain this overall flow of oil into civilization um, when you can no longer do it with the, the easy stuff. So that was produced by the, um, effectively, the US Department of Energy. And so if we compare that with the, the sister agency, the International Energy Agency uh, based in Paris, this is their world uh, energy outlook. Uh, this was produced in 2012, but the, the situation is no different. It's just quite a, a nice uh, illustration, so I, I've chosen this. But if you look at the, the dark blue um, bars at the bottom, well, this basically says what the other slide did from the, the US-based uh, agency, that the uh, conventional oil production is in decline. Peaked around 2005, and that's what it's going to uh, fall away, as, as these bars indicate. But it's a bit more optimistic, because they've actually tried to identify alternative uh, oil sources that might take up the slack, as it were. So if you look at the, uh, the light blue uh, bars, um, fields yet to be developed. Okay, most of these are in deep water, but they won't be developed until a barrel of oil is $100 or $150, because deep water drilling is very, very expensive. So, again, that depends on the oil price. Fields yet to be found, well, yeah, okay, there's probably a few more around in deep water. Natural gas liquids, they're not really the same thing as petroleum, they're like hydrocarbons. Uh, for example, you can't really make petrol from, from natural gas liquids. And just to point out, the, we sometimes talk of the thin blue line. Well, this is the thin red line. And light, tight oil 
that is the amount of oil reckoned to be produced from shale through fracking. Not a lot, is it? When you've got this massive fall in production, for all the, the hype there is about fracking, I don't think it's really going to come to our aid, even if we uh, bite the bullet and take on all the other, um, we bear all the other issues that are likely to be associated with fracking. So, okay, um, if the oil supply is, it's not running out, we're going to be producing oil for, for decades, but as I say, it's maintaining that overall flow of uh, 30 billion barrels a year into global civilization. So we've got a problem because we've got rid of the, or we've got through the, the, easy, uh, the easy to process and easy to get stuff. So we need to find alternative fuels, but because oil is so uh, ubiquitously used for uh, all the materials of, of modern civilization, uh, we need alternative carbon feedstocks for industry if we're going to try and maintain things in the, the kind of shape that they are now. The other aspect, of course, is that burning oil uh, produces something like 30% of all the carbon emissions that uh, can be blamed on human beings. And, okay, uh, some people have argued, well, as the oil production starts to fall away, this must be a good thing, mustn't it? Because you'll have less uh, carbon emissions. But naturally, of course, when you have a global civilization that relies on moving goods and people and energy and just about everything else around, um, as the oil supply starts to, uh, to fail, then, of course, so does everything else. And trying to maintain uh, what we have now uh, is likely to prove extremely challenging, to, to put it mildly. So, I just want to look at a few alternatives because the, um, the main problem with um, an oil supply issue is a liquid fuels crisis. So there are other ways of getting uh, liquid fuels of various kinds. So, first of all, we can consider bioethanol. So this is a, a field of sugar beet uh, growing in Norfolk, grows very well in this country. So the name of the game here is that you get your sugar out of the sugar beet, you ferment it into ethanol, and you separate that from the water somehow, and you get, roughly speaking, about five tonnes of ethanol per hectare. Okay, but if we were to provide all our liquid fuels in the volume that we use them now uh, as we get them from petroleum, we would need basically um, more than half the amount of arable land we have available. So, to put it differently, if we stopped growing food crops altogether and we simply grew sugar crops, um, we could still only produce less than half our liquid fuels in the form of bioethanol. Now, that is a measure of the great volume of them that we get through. Um, cellulosic ethanol is often uh, spoken of as, as a, a possible solution. But uh, the, the truth of the matter is that uh, you get about five tonnes, uh, if you were growing miscanthus, for example, another five tonnes uh, per hectare, and you can use marginal land rather than uh, prime quality land. But again, you would require very large areas, which is going to be a limiting factor. Also, you need uh, special enzymes for breaking down the, um, the cellulose into sugars uh, to be fermented, and they're very expensive. <coughs> So at the moment, um, this is a completely um, uncommercial proposition because it would cost you 10 times as much um, per gallon of fuel uh, from cellulosic ethanol than, uh, say, for a gallon of petrol. So uh, that's uh, another uh, limitation. Right, biodiesel is actually even worse. Um, I'm assuming that we've converted all our, our engines to, to run on diesel which would be a good thing in some respects, because, uh, to put it this way, you get more miles per gallon out of diesel than you do burning petrol in spark ignition engines. But you'd still need about 40 million tonnes of it uh, per annum. So this time, uh, cutting uh, a long story short, if we stopped uh, growing food crops and we just uh, grew rapeseed uh, for, for biodiesel, we could this time match only perhaps one-seventh of our liquid fuels requirements. So we really are limited. The other thing that's often not uh, mentioned when people talk about uh, biofuels is if you're using land-based crops, well, how do you grow them? How do you harvest them? With the same combine harvesters and so forth. So they themselves need liquid fuels to run them. And you would be lucky to have a break-even point between what you, you produced in terms of energy and what you required. Now, um, this is not the most prepossessing looking stuff, probably. Um, but this is, is algae, um, sometimes called pond scum. It's green because it contains chlorophyll um, in the same way as land-based plants do. So that means that uh, algae undergo photosynthesis 
they absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which, which builds the body of the, of the algae, the same way that the, the body um, of plants is, is built from, from carbon dioxide and water uh, driven by sunlight. But the idea is if you grow enough of this stuff and then dry it, you're going to get rid of all the water, which is another disadvantage. But that you could convert this in, into, into liquid fuels um, as an alternative to using land-based crops. And I must say that there are some potential advantages to this. So, for example, you, you'd have to grow them in tanks. But uh, if you take that in terms of how much you get per, per hectare, um, the yield is between about 40 and 100 times better um, than uh, growing rapeseed, for example. So, to put it another way, you would only need a couple of percent of the total UK land area to provide enough uh, liquid fuels to uh, run all the transportation we have. You don't need to use cropland because you can stick the tanks anywhere. And there's a, there's a project going at Cranfield University, and the engineers there, they're figuring out how to float these tanks out at sea. So you wouldn't need to compromise land as you do uh, with, with land-based based crops. Interesting idea. Uh, you can grow algae well on saline water or wastewater. So you don't have the huge demand on fresh water that you do if, if you want to grow uh, biofuel crops. And what I really like about this, although I don't believe for a moment we're ever going to get the equivalent of uh, 30 billion uh, barrels of, of uh, oil uh, in the form of algal biofuels, Nonetheless, on a smaller scale, uh, you could uh, have a combination strategy where you can grow uh, your, your algae and produce liquid fuels uh, from the algae. But simultaneously, you can actually feed them uh, materials that you want to get rid of. So, for example, a big problem um, is uh, eutrophication, which is the buildup of nitrate and phosphate in the, in the water systems, which encourages the growth of algae you really don't want because that leads to... Um, toxic effects and dead zones and, and all this sort of thing uh, via the algal blues. Okay, so if you can feed your algae the stuff you want to get rid of and simultaneously you could also uh, give them the CO2 emissions from a fossil fuel fired power station, you've really solved two problems in one. And if at the same time you can create algae to produce liquid fuels um, rather than needing uh, crude oil to produce them, then really that, that's a win-win-win situation. Now this slide here, um, it's an artist's impression, it's a computer graphic, but the idea is this great uh, area of lawns, uh, which is what the, this, the, the green is, these, uh, these tanks basically containing algae, um, that you, you would put this installation next door to a fossil fuel fired power plant pumping out CO2 and somehow you could feed that into the water that the algae are growing in. And if you also had a, a sewage a wastewater treatment plant there, then really you have this sort of integrated structure that solves two problems, and indeed three in terms of what you, you might get out of the algae. So I like that as a kind of a holistic solution. Right, I could hardly give a talk about oil uh, without mentioning fracking. Now, hydraulic fracturing is, is the technical name for the actual process I'll describe in a minute, where you break the rock open. But you can see all this stuff has arrived in a town somewhere. And uh, when this happens, when uh, it all turns up, it's sometimes been described as being a bit like the circus coming to town. And of course, the circus has to leave town eventually. But if you're bringing all these truckloads of stuff in, uh, very often you've got to reinforce the ground, you've got to build new roads, you, you have a big pressure on the prevailing infrastructure, which sometimes has to be borne by the state or the, the, the local authority. But you bring all this together, you need the pump wagons, you need the, the wellhead, which is the thing that's left behind when the circus leaves town, and that's supposed to produce gas or oil for the next 30 years. Nobody knows how long these will produce for, because it's not been done on the grand scale or over a sufficiently long time scale um, to know as yet. But it's a fairly significant, and it's not a cheap operation. It takes a lot of energy and a lot of money to do this. But what is hydraulic fracturing, fracking, and why would anybody bother? Okay, well, in a nutshell, um, you have uh, some rocks uh, that are called impermeable, uh, like shales. And they contain gas or oil. Uh, that's fine. It's often very good quality oil. But it can't get out. It can't escape. So what you're going to do is break the rock open so that it can actually get out. 
So the way this is done, um, you, you drill a, a well, drill a hole in the ground basically, as is normally done, but if all you were doing was drilling vertical wells, because the shale layers are um, fairly uh, thin, as it were, you would hit a relatively small volume uh, in one go. So what's done is so-called horizontal drilling. So you drill down vertically, and then you mechanically turn the drill bit for about 90 degrees, and then you can drill into hundreds, thousands of metres of shale. So you can therefore access a very, uh, very large volume. And you can drill around a sixpence, basically. You can do one well like this, you can do another, you can do another. You, you can drill around the circle, basically. So what you then do is you put down what's called a, a casing string, which is basically steel pipes um, screwed together, and basically that lines the well. At each stage of doing this, you pump down cement, so that uh, holds the structure in place, but it's also supposed to provide a, a barrier which prevents what's in the, in the well from leaking into the ground, basically. The only place that fracking has been done on a serious scale is America, and so what about doing it outside of the US? Because that's what uh, we're, uh, or some people are concerned about. Quadrilla, for example, uh, doing it uh, under Surrey, for example. Now, the rocks are different in Europe uh, than the ones in America. And so the likelihood is um, they will be less productive and the quality of the gas may not be as good um, as was the, state, the, the situation in, in the United States. Indeed, uh, they've drilled the sweet spots, the good rocks, where they're exploring further out, um, the energy returns are much poorer. And it's likely, there's a paper that I mentioned here published in Nature a couple of years ago, where they discuss how good a long-term prospect it's likely to be. And it's not convincing, quite honestly. Um, shale gas, you don't know what the quality of the gas is going to be. Um, I have a friend who's a Russian geologist, and he was talking about when they were drilling uh, shale gas wells in Poland. And he said, did you know that um, in a lot of those wells, the gas that came up, which you hoped to be methane, he said it was so full of nitrogen they couldn't burn it. So you don't know what the quality of the gas is going to be when you get it, and you don't know what the production rate is going to be either until you start drilling. So it's very hard to anticipate these things before uh, you actually uh, make a start on it. There was a report by the Royal Society uh, a while ago which concluded that you could do hydraulic fracturing safely in the UK, so long as it was very well regulated. Well, that's really the, the critical point, among others. Mm. Are you familiar with the term Mandeland? No. Right. It stands for miles and miles of bugger all. <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> miles and miles of bugger all. No, the, the, the Mandeland. Yeah, there we are, Mandeland. Europe is not Mandeland, unlike the, the United States. Yeah. And what this refers to is that in the US, where most of the, the drilling, the fracking has been done, it's in wide open spaces where nobody lives. Of course, if you were going to start fracking the UK, this is very densely populated, so you're going to start doing it underneath people's houses. And another aspect, or that uh, would make uh, most of us a bit nervous, I think, but another aspect, in America, the, the law is such that if you have oil or gas or something anybody wants um, under your land, it's yours, they've got to pay you money for it. Um, in the UK, it wouldn't be that way. Um, it belongs to the state, effectively. So you, you don't have any uh, particular, if they were to drill under your house, um, you're not necessarily going to make your fortune from it. So it's, it's a different uh, sort of point. Anyway. Um, Concluding this, um, shale, as a geologic fact, contains more gas than oil, and so overall, um, as the, the thin red lines seem to indicate, it's not going to be a solution to uh, the loss of conventional oil. It may buy time with gas, but I don't think it's going to change the oil situation. Okay, this is my uh, moment to move on to biodiversity. Um, last year, the UN General Assembly um, declared it to be the International Year of Soils. And without reading all, all this lot out, the point was that, um, okay, soils are being very, very heavily uh, degraded and eroded. And what this was all about was to raise awareness, um, well, among everybody, but especially policy makers, um, about the importance of soil. Not only that you need good soil if you want uh, good uh, quality land to, to feed everybody, but there is an intimate uh, connection between the biological water cycle and the carbon cycles. So soil is, is really quite central to all of this. So if you want to, to uh, 
adapt to um, climate change and mitigate the, uh, the worst effects of that. And if you want, as I say, to feed everybody in the future, you want to uh, carry on with sustainable development, then you need to preserve and build the soils. And that was really what that was about. So there was a lot of good information around what a difference it will make is, uh, is a moot point. But okay, this is the problem. Uh, soil is being de uh, degraded mostly by erosion. 85% is probably um, basically the fact that stuff gets uh, blown or washed away. Other effects too, compaction of soil, um, that has a bad effect in, in all, all sorts of ways. As you lose the, the organic matter from the soil, it loses its structure, it loses its ability to absorb and hold water, and it, it starts to become depleted of nutrients when these processes take place. And these overall effects cause a loss of the soil biodiversity. And soil is remarkable because it contains one quarter of all the biodiversity on Earth. That's to say one quarter of all the organisms on Earth, mostly bacteria. They actually live in the soil. So it really is critical to, to maintain and uh, preserve soils. This is a, a global uh, phenomenon, as you can see. Um, very degraded soil, those are the ones marked in red. There, there are different definitions for these things, but very degraded soil has been explained to me as being land that's lost something like 70% of its topsoil, so it really is fairly, uh, fairly heavily degraded. And it's going on across the world on a, an, alarming, uh, an alarming rate. So a few uh, interesting or frightening facts about soil. So for a start, um, a quarter of all the Earth's biodiversity is in the soil. So how we treat the soils has a big impact on the biodiversity of the Earth. Um, over half the land used for agriculture is moderately to severely uh, affected by uh, soil degradation, mostly through erosion. Now it takes, depending on the climatic conditions, somewhere between say 200 and 1,000 years to form an inch of soil. But soil from agricultural land is being lost many, many times faster than that, up to 40 times. And in the last 40 years, something like one third of the world's crop land has become unproductive as a result of soil degradation. And but half the world's livestock are uh, vulnerable um, to degradation, especially if this is uh, exacerbated by climate change. And, well, you know, in, in, a, in a nutshell, we need to produce 70% more food by 2050, um, not only because the population will be greater, but of course there'll be more meat eaters because people will be more affluent. Now that seems to be a, a correspondence between uh, people having more money, they tend to eat more meat. And so we need all this, we're trying to um, drag more and more out of the land, and yet we are degrading it. This seems to be two forces that are really working in totally opposite directions. Um, you're probably uh, aware of this, uh, many people are not, is that there is a soil-water connection, that the soil is an implicit part of the, uh, the natural water cycle. And so basically, if you've got good quality uh, soil, it's got good structure, it's covered, it's not compacted, it acts like a sponge. So the water um, that is evaporated into the atmosphere rains down, the, uh, the soil soaks it up. That's great. Um, if the soil is covered, this tends to um, mitigate against uh, erosion of soil. But also, if the, the water is absorbed, you have less runoff. So, if you like, there's less uh, erosion further down. Also, the aquifers are recharged if the, the soilers are able to, to absorb the water properly. But if you get this wrong, which is what happens at the moment, you get your soil and your water in the wrong places. So you have water shortages, you have flooding, and you have this overall impoverishing in the, the quality of the soil. So it's important to, to do these things. Covering the ground is absolutely critical. So, Putting this in, in uh, more straightforward terms, and this, is, this paper is quite interesting. Um, this shows that if you cover your ground to the extent of 20%, then you lose uh, maybe an inch of soil in 25 years. If you cover it to 80%, then that rate of erosion is reduced to a tenth. So you lose an inch of soil in 250 years, which is practically uh, the natural rate of soil production. So by covering the soil, you bring the erosion and the creation of soil back into balance with one another. So that, that's, that's really what this, this uh, paper uh, is, is showing. 
How do you protect and regenerate soil? Well, as I say, cover the ground, uh, reforestation, planting trees. I, I must confess that uh, a long time ago, I could never understand why all these green folk wanted to go around planting trees everywhere. I, I just didn't quite understand it at all. But that was in my ignorance, where I didn't realize how important trees were in all sorts of uh, different ways, their connection with the soil. Um, indeed, recent research has shown that uh, soil uh, that has trees planted over it is much, much more effective uh, in absorbing water, for example. So it's all tied in. You plant uh, cover crops, uh, peas and beans, for example, they're nitrogen fixers, so that uh, contributes not only to the organic matter in the soil, but to, to the organic nitrogen uh, content. All sorts of things you can do. Um, trees provide windbreaks, which also um, reduces the, the level of erosion. Um, there's a procedure called farmer-managed natural regeneration, which is sort of grand-scale pruning. So basically, in Niger, they managed to bring back 5 million hectares of barren land to life um, at a level of 40 trees per hectare. And essentially, you just chop away anything that's growing and preventing the, the trees from growing. Of course, um, land-based uh, plants, especially forests, produce a large uh, component of the nitrogen in the atmosphere, so that's another good reason for having them. And effectively, with your, your good soil, um, building the, the structure and the, the soil organic matter content, you build the soil food web. The soil food web, those are the organisms, uh, primarily bacteria but, and fungi, but that live within the soil itself. It's reckoned that in healthy soil, you have something like one billion microbes in a, in a teaspoonful. So that's really quite, quite amazing. The soil food web, this is one uh, description of it. You've got the different trophic levels, from the very simple single-celled uh, bacteria and fungi. And effectively, all these creatures uh, eat one another and their excretion products. So that's why it's a web rather than a chain. And if you want to know if you've got good soil with all the stuff uh, going on in it, you don't need a microscope to look at these things. If it's full of earthworms, if your compost heap, your ground is full of worms, it gives you a good indication that all this other stuff is in place, all these other creatures are there. So the soil food web is, is a, a really critical, uh, the uh, critical component uh, probably of soil. Now, this is quite, quite interesting. Um, this was in the Independence uh, recently, and it, it was basically saying Britain has only 100 harvests left. Right, now what does that really mean? Well, this was a study that came out of Sheffield University, so I, I phoned up uh, Professor Dunnett, and I said, did you really say this? He said, well, no, not exactly. He said, but uh, the, the point was that um, there will be a crisis due to the, uh, the impoverishment of um, soil uh, due to industrialised agriculture at some point during this, this century. Wow. And so what they're really uh, saying is that if you compare land that, that's farmed on the, on the commercial scale compared to uh, land that is uh, used by people on the smaller scale, then that is much better quality, the latter. Where land is actually tended by people uh, rather than machinery being used, it has much higher levels of nutrients, it's got more organic matter, it's got better structure, it really is better stuff. Also, um, as we know, there is a problem with the pollinators dying off. So the soil and the biodiversity um, beyond the soil, they are intimately connected. So by rebuilding the soil, uh, we start to, to rebuild everything. So how do we um, tend land on the small scale? I dig for victory during World War II. That was very successful. Uh, it enabled people to grow quite a significant proportion of all the veg that uh, was consumed during that period where um, the boats, uh, the ships bringing uh, food in from elsewhere were being torpedoed by the U-boats and, and so on. But what would be a good method for growing food on a small scale? Well, I would like to raise mention of permaculture. You're probably familiar with permaculture, quite a few of you, uh, more than most audiences are. Okay, well, permaculture, for, for the benefit of those who are maybe uh, less aware of it, I'm not going to go into this, this in any, any detail. Uh, it's a portmanteau word, stands for permanent culture or permanent agriculture, and it was invented by a, a couple of Australians about 40 years ago. And the critical aspect, um, as I see it, of permaculture is it's not just sustainable, which is great, it means you can carry on doing the same things, but it's also regenerative. 
So, for example, you can restore highly degraded landscapes using permaculture methods. And there are fantastic projects across the, the whole world where this has been done. So, for example, there is the Chikukwa uh, project in Zimbabwe. And over 25 years, they managed to uh, restore to verdancy a highly uh, eroded and degraded landscape. And these principles, I mean, permaculture is not a thing, it is a design system. You can grow it not only to how you treat land, but any project at all. You know, it, it really is the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. You put the, the critical elements together in the right way, the critical people, whatever components you are, depending on what, what, you, what you want to do. Um, there are lots of quotes to Albert Einstein. I don't know if this, whether he actually said this or not, but it's, it's a good one. He said, or whoever uh, said it said, you cannot solve a problem from the same consciousness that created it. You must learn to see the world anew. And that is really what uh, applying permaculture is to me. It is a different way. It's, not a, it's getting away from linear models of growth. It's a more sort of holistic, integrated way of, uh, of designing and putting things together. Well, the, the overall um, advantages here are many, but certainly you, you can get away because you build your soil structure. Um, you need less water and application of, of artificial fertilizers. But what permaculture does, because you can put these different elements, these different um, plants and so forth together, is to exploit the, the third dimension. So plants grow at different heights, so some of them shade others, some uh, the taller ones get the benefit of all the light there is in terms of photosynthesis. But of course the roots go to different depths in the soil, so the third dimension is being exploited there, because the roots are extracting um, nutrients at different depths too, principles. And this is David Holmgren's uh, 12 principles. You see in the middle the three permaculture ethics, um, care for the earth, yes, don't degrade the earth, care for it. Um, similarly, uh, don't degrade people, care for them. And then fair shares, I, that's often taken to mean uh, don't take more than you need. But it's also about return of surplus to the whole ecosystem. So collectively, everything in it benefits. And the one down the bottom, produce no waste, because there is no waste in nature, in a forest. Everything from the leaf litter, um, it's just consumed by the fungi and returned to the soil. Everything is recycled. It's, it's a perfect recycling mechanism, which is a, a better way of approaching uh, things than the, the linear model. Forest garden and the principle of layers. It's more or less what I was saying, that you can exploit the third dimension. So you've got a tall fruit tree, you've got other trees and, and shrubs that sample different, uh, their roots sample different depths of the soil, and they have different effects in, in terms of uh, how they uh, take the light or shield others from the light. Well, if you want to see um, whether this may work in practice, one of the best examples I've come across is the uh, Risk Roof Garden in Reading. Have you been there, some of you? Yeah, okay, right. Oh, this is one of the most amazing things I've seen. Um, you know, it, in terms of its, um, its importance, it, it's the Taj Mahal, you know, it's, it's really quite wonderful. Because all this stuff. It looks like a jungle, doesn't it? I mean, there's a 20-foot cherry tree up there. All this lot is growing in about a foot of soil on the roof of a building, uh, risk the uh, Reading International Solidarity Centre, um, in the middle of Reading. So you think, well, if you can do this um, on a roof in the middle of Reading, then it shows what you can do with urban space that you might not normally think would be much use. Um, there were many reasons for doing this project, but that was one of them, to show what might be done with urban space. So here's a few more um, pictures of it. I mean, it's, it's just amazing. As I say, there are different trees, there are shrubs. There are about 200 different uh, plants up there all together. But it's almost been a bit more successful than was hoped. And now they're getting the engineering department at Reading University to recalculate the stresses on the building. <laughs> it's a strong building. It used to be Blackpool's bookshop. So they used to store the books upstairs. So there's plenty of iron girders and so forth but uh, it could be an issue at some point. I, I calculate there's a good hundred tons of stuff up there altogether, so uh, we see how we get on. Okay, um, the, the final point in the title, the changing climate. Um, as I alluded, um, I, I don't tend to use the term climate change, because carbon emissions and climate change, that's just really one element of, of the main problem. And all these different things, uh, the problems that face us, Population, what are we going to do about it? 11 billion by 2100. Peak resources, whether it's oil or uranium, 
you know, the, the, the fish stocks in the world have peaked now, the soil uh, has peaked. You know, we, we've got through, uh, you know, 10 years ago, we had more um, good quality uh, soil covered land that we do now, so it's all going in the wrong direction, all sorts of issues. We're thought to be in the midst of the sixth um, great mass extinction, meaning the loss of biodiversity now um, is at least as great or more than it was in the previous five. So it's not looking good. All these other things, people are too fat, they don't get enough exercise. Nature deficit disorder, it's, show, it's thought that um, people, children, uh, don't get out in nature enough and it's possible to improve people psychologically, treat depression, uh, treat young offenders by getting people out in nature. It's just more where we ought to be rather than where we spend our time or are forced to spend our time in the world we're in at the moment. And, well, there are all, all these problems, basically. I, I describe them as the world's woes. That is the changing climate. But I don't view these, these as individual problems, but symptoms of a single problem, which is basically overconsumption, using up our resources too quickly, and with no regard, in, in that linear growth model fashion, and not regarding what the consequences are, what, you know, like the soil food, work, what the excretion products of our use of our resources are. And it's been described not by me as the sins of the farmers, which is a sort of impoverishing scenario where things get worse on worse generation on generation from uh, both uh, having less and less resources available, but also having to deal with the, uh, the, the pollution. And I would offer growth, uh, where basically growth is possible, if no longer globally. We can grow how we do things on the smaller scale, um, including using permaculture methods, and as a way of addressing how we use our, our resources better in a more um, sustainable way. So if we start to do this, we can start to build the soil with carbon uh, effectively taken from the atmosphere, which has uh, positive effects on climate change. And there are many studies that show that more biodiverse systems are more resilient um, than uh, monoculture systems. The Rodale Institute in America, uh, they, they've run uh, two systems for about uh, 40 years. And among the many things they show, one that with their system, using no artificial inputs of fertilizers, there's not really any uh, lower yield than uh, the, the conventional, well, conventional, this has only been going for about 60 or 70 years, but industrialized, that's what I mean. And also, in times of water stress, they find their system is more resilient. The, the yields are maintained compared to the case where you use the, the more uh, industrial approach. So, quite interesting. I like this cartoon, so a uh, lot of biodiversity. You've got this chap here, he's about to take uh, the family off in the car somewhere for their entertainment. And he's looking over the wall at his, his neighbour, who's in his very messy garden, playing with his family, or sleeping, or doing whatever. And he says, you should concrete over, it makes life so much easier. And there is a, a sort of point there, if, if simple is what he wants, compared to uh, the rather messy life he sees his, his, his neighbour having. But of course, concreting uh, and tarmacking over the ground is a very good way of stopping it from absorbing water and this contributes to, to many of the, the flooding and also uh, drought conditions across the, the urban world. Um, carbon emissions and, and climate change. Yeah, there was a paper published in Nature at the end of last year uh, which estimated that for a 50% chance um, of avoiding the, the two degree increase in the mean global temperature um, by the end of the century, it would be necessary to leave a third of the world's oil reserves half the, the gas reserves and 80% of the, the coal in the ground up to 2050. And they say that um, the idea of developing resources in the Arctic and increasing unconventional oil production, i.e. From, from oil shale, for example, are incommensurate with efforts to limit average global warming to two degrees throughout the 21st century. So in other words, we've got enough already, or access to enough already, without really working harder and harder to get hold of more of the, uh, the unconventional stuff. Uh, because if we do that, then we can probably cut the planet uh, three to five times. I tend to think more in terms of production rates rather than static reckoning. And so what this uh, seems to work out uh, too 
is we need to reduce our production rate of oil by 5%. Well, that's not difficult, that's going to happen to us anyway. We need to grow our gas uh, production rate by 60% and cut our production of coal by about 70%. Effectively, you've got a big substitution of, of gas for coal. And if you did that, then you could cut uh, carbon emissions from 48 uh, billion tonnes of CO2 equivalent in 2010 to uh, about less than half that by 2050. And yet, if you look at the BP statistical review, which I think is a more reliable indication of what's really happening, um, it indicates that by 2035, um, let alone 2050, um, although there will have been a substitution of gas for coal, still our carbon emissions will have gone up by 30%, so it'll be more like 50% by uh, 2050. So you seem to have the, the forces of what we need to do if we really want to, to trammel ourselves in within this temperature limit and what's actually happening. They seem to be going in almost uh, symmetrically opposite directions. The future of energy. Well, just to sort of round things up. Okay, in my opinion, the most important thing we can do, um, even more than trying to say, can we get more oil or gas out of shale, can we dig more coal, how deep can we go in the water, can we get more bitumen? We need to look toward energy efficiency. So for example, buildings need to be much better insulated than they are now. Uh, draft busting, uh, there's a man called Tony Cowley uh, in Reddick, a really good guy among the many things he does. He goes round and he shows people how to draft proof their houses. It saves a huge amount of energy if you do that. Very, very important. Um, it is thought there may be limitations to how much renewable, low carbon energy, solar and wind could be got quickly enough. And some people, I don't really have an opinion on this, but for this reason, some people are looking toward nuclear power and uh, thorium reactors, for example. I mean, the, the main reason we have a uranium-powered uh, nuclear uh, power industry is because they wanted plutonium to make atom bombs. Uh, it wasn't just for energy or electricity too cheap to meet it. Um, thorium would actually be a much uh, safer way of doing this. But I just uh, throw that on the table. I think certainly um, because of the oil supply problem, we're going to need to reduce our level of oil uh, fuel transport. And that will necessitate doing things on the local level much more, growing food and uh, producing energy and, and many other things. And the, the other point. Um, is there is a nexus between the, the, these different uh, factors. And as I said, um, soil and, and water have this, this connection through the hydrologic the, the water cycle. But also, all uh, energy sources are incredibly thirsty. It takes a lot of oil to, to mine coal or uh, produce oil and, and gas. Uh, really all of them, if you, you want water to cool nuclear power plants, power plants generally. It's reckoned it will be necessary to grow our use of water, our flow of water into the, the mechanism of civilization by 85% uh, within the next 20 years if we want to uh, increase our energy as is anticipated. And it may be because we're already on a water stressed planet as things are, over pumping aquifers, it might be the amount of water available that will set limits to how much energy we might be able to produce in, in the future. And as I say, the rebuilding and protection of soil because of that nexus uh, too. And I think it's true to say that you can't decouple, for the reasons that I, I've mentioned, our use of energy from our use and the availability of water and soil. And so we need to think in a more integrated way to uh, produce a durable, sustainable system that meets human needs but isn't going to just collapse at some point. And uh, yeah, whether it's uh, a curse or not, uh, we certainly live in interesting times. Okay, I will stop there. Thank you for listening to me. Wow. Field your own questions, or do you want um, to be chaired? Oh, I, I can uh, field myself. <laughs> okay, okay the, the, the man at the front. Um, I'm just I'm getting a picture of the the way that fracking works, where mm. these uh, collars of steel tubes are connected together, 
you cast a concrete uh, casing around, yeah. you go at 90 degrees across, so you have more <coughs> range and scope. Mm. But I don't understand where you start blowing things up and where the pressure oh. comes in, so I just want to know. Yeah, okay. As I said, you, you put these across the oil industry, and um, basically, whether you're um, putting your, your drill string together, that's, yeah, the, the, the pipe you need to drill the stuff out in the first place, or the, uh, the casing string, which is a steel tube that you, you use to line the well. They come in 40 foot length, and they're screwed together, and you know, the thickness is about so, basically. Okay, but if you want to make some sort of ingress um, into the shale uh, from that, you need to blow holes in it. And you can blow those holes, you can create those holes where you like by putting this uh, perforating gun down, which has the explosive charges. And what's actually done, it's done in sometimes up to 30 stages, because some of these uh, horizontal wells, they can be, oh, you know, a mile or so, basically. And so this is actually a very convenient way of doing it. Think, right, okay, we're there. They, they, they can tell, um, with their, their equipment, where it is, right, they know where the shell is, right, blast, blow the holes there, so on and so on. And so at that point, having created the, those holes in the pipe, um, that the system is, the rock is kind of exposed. And you then pump the, uh, the hydraulic fracking fluid down, and then that comes out of the holes and into the rock. And as the pressure increases uh, beyond the, uh, the mechanical strength of the rock, the rock just cracks open. And shale, you know, it's layer on layer on layer, and you're kind of breaking these apart. That's why you need the proper to hold the layers apart after you've done it. And so it's actually a convenient way of doing it. There are other ways of doing it, but um, this is, is the most commonly used one. You know where you are with a bit of explosive. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I'm fascinated by the idea of having an electric car, mm. but I'm not going to at the moment because <coughs> I have to take electricity from the board. However, the board is going to make it with coal or whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm also fascinated by the idea that in Iceland they're having hydrogen cells. Mm. There seems to be a very clean way of doing it. The only effluent is water, which we can put up with. And uh, you haven't mentioned hydrogen cells, but maybe it's such a minor thing that it's not very important. Mm. It's um, rather volatile. Iceland is in a rather um, unique position because they're sitting on the North Atlantic Ridge. In, in other words, basically, um, the two halves of Iceland are separated. So they've got uh, molten rock, very, very hot. It's much easier to extract huge amounts of geothermal energy that way than we could um, un under Oxfordshire. Mm -hmm. So that's a real advantage. And of course, if you have um, a, a cheap source of electricity, it's clean. No reason uh, to, to not uh, use, use hydrogen, fair enough. But as you say, um, our main sources of, uh, of power at the moment um, are the fossil fuels. So we would need to really ramp up from about 2% um, to substitute the 80 odd percent to start to make a significant difference. And it's not until we increase, and I don't know that we could do it, by some huge number, um, our amount of renewable energy that we could even consider doing things like this. Now, some people consider we should build more nuclear reactors as the low carbon energy source. Um, but you're right, because if all you're going to do um, is make your electricity in a standard um, coal or gas fired power station, um, it really is rather um, a waste of time to make clean hydrogen. It's often uh, described as carbon's dirty secret. If you look at the statistics, it's really quite interesting. If you um, have a car that burns uh, petrol and you have an electric car, depending on how that particular nation makes its electricity, um, your electric car can actually be dirtier when you consider what's called the tailpipe. Um, than uh, a reasonably efficient um, liquid fuel burning car. If you're in France, well, you're laughing because they make 80% of their electricity from nuclear power. So in terms of carbon emissions, uh, you know, go to France and have your electric car and you're really um, contributing to saving the planet. But in India, for example, and China, where they make uh, much of their electricity from coal, then it, it can really be the other way around. Our roof panels, PV, would be very helpful in Mm. I, I, mean, I think that there is no single solution and what 
the solution is a mix of smaller solutions. We're going to need an energy mix, basically. But as I said, that's going to be combined with doing things on a more local uh, level and using our energy at more efficient. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. I understand that the waste products of thorium, um, energy production through mm -hmm. thorium, are far less toxic than yeah. um, from conventional nuclear. What are the prospects, do you think, of the government actually considering it seriously as an alternative to nuclear? Mm. I mean, it, our government, that's a debatable point, the Chinese government are putting a lot of money into thorium reactors, yes. so they're taking it seriously, yes. because China is considering um, clean energy um, very seriously. They, they burn a lot of coal at the moment, because um, they have it. But uh, I, th I think our, our government is fairly reactionary. And they would think thorium, you know, what, what's wrong what's with that? what we've got now kind of thing. Yeah. But yeah, my understanding is there are many advantages to thorium. Another thing um, is in terms of if somebody <coughs> wanted to have a, a bomb in a suitcase, um, with thorium, that's right, it's uranium-232, yeah, the fissile nucleus you get from thorium is, is uranium-233. From, uh, yeah, yeah it's, it's thorium goes to uranium, uranium-233, similarly to uranium-235, as we use in standard uh, power stations produced by uranium uh, enrichment. But there's also a contaminant, uranium-232, which is a very strong uh, gamma emitter. So it would be very, very difficult to shield that. You know, if, if you had a low, well, if you had that much lead in your suitcase, uh, that would uh, slow the alpha particles down, and you probably couldn't detect it uh, very easily. But this contaminant would make it very, very difficult to uh, proliferate. Hmm. Yes, Hugh. Um, I'm actually experimenting with small-scale projects. Hmm. And uh, I don't know anything about uh, this fuel from algae, but I'd like to know. Um, we have about two or three buckets of food waste every day here. Mm. Could that be used in a small scale scheme to uh, grow algae? Um, <laughs> it might need to be processed into some form. I mean, when they, they grow algae um, normally, um, what's done is the nutrients are added as soluble phosphate, for example, and carbon dioxide is pumped in. I'm not aware of, uh, let me think. Um, I, I think the answer to your question is yes, but you would need the right sort of arrangement. You might need to process your food waste in some way that it's not lumps of it. It's like a sort of slurry. You need a sort of stir in there so that it's being constantly kept in suspension. Uh, so, right, okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, it, it, it's, a, it's a possible project, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, yes? Um, it's, your talk has been so interesting, thank you. And I think a lot of us are aware of these problems. But could you give us some insight? You are an advisor, I understand, to the EU. And how is the EU and how is the British government? Uh, are they seriously looking at these things? or? Uh, I, for example, I heard that fracking had been banned in Germany. They just said, no, we don't want anything to do with it. Could you give us an update as to you know, what's happening in Europe with regards to this thing? Yeah, um, fracking is highly contentious, as we know. Um, but I, I think the difference between Germany and many other countries is a very, very strong uh, green um, force within uh, its government. And so the fears over the contamination problems and earthquakes and all that attendant to fracking, they were sufficient to override the, the voices from the other side saying, yes, but we need the energy. Now, in this country, um, I think the voice of the Greens is rather weaker than the voices from the other side and the voice of money. Because if there is money to be made from fracking, then I am pretty darn sure it's going to happen, really. Um, now, there, there's not a unified European energy policy 
I, mean, I, I do advise the European Commission. I generally advise them on what projects are worth supporting or not. So I'm an evaluator. Um, the European uh, Commission is a big pot of money, effectively. And people come along and they say, oh, well, we want to build an algal fuel plant. Somebody else, we want a huge uh, solar farm. Somebody else wants, and so on. And you just, you know, a group of about six of you have to get together and try and evaluate the, the relative merits. Because, you know, you've got, say, 100 million euros in one budget. But you've got 300 applications and they're asking for 3 billion euros. So you've got to really narrow it down now. I deal mostly on the, uh, the basic research side of things, but still, some of the projects I deal with, you've got to look at the technical readiness level and the manufacturing readiness level. So if somebody says, well, okay, give us money for five years and we'll have at least a prototype, if not a factory, actually producing algal biofuels or something. So it's that kind of thing. So the European Commission is supporting uh, different kinds of projects and they are into low carbon energy. But I think that there is an awareness that you know, you've got at the moment 2% on one side and 80% on the other. So there's no call, right, you know, 10 years time, we're gonna phase out the fossil fuels. Although they, the force, the outcome of the Paris Climate Change uh, Conference, I think that is really making people think, hmm, we've really got to change things uh, over the next 20 years. Uh, if they want to keep below the, the one and a half degree, uh, let alone the two degree level, we do really um, have a quite different system and operation before 2050, let alone uh, by the end of the century. So I don't think that's going to happen, but I, I think things are mostly driven by economics, aren't they, in the, in the, uh, the global or the, the capitalist world that, that we have across the globe. And I think when you have, uh, as an example, the Rockefeller Foundation um, disinvesting in fossil fuels. Probably not entirely altruistically, but they think, well, look at this. It, it's a really bad business prospect, isn't it? Right, let's go and get you know, into manufacturing solar panels. We'll put our money into that instead. So I think change will come about that way. And then as that, that change uh, starts to happen, it gathers momentum, then that will change the research policy within the European Commission. And then the money will sort of go away from more efficient coal mining techniques and uh, oil extraction techniques and so on, and more towards renewables and, and energy efficiency uh, technologies. So I think the whole thing is in flux, basically. And you know, the ideas follow the money, but then the, 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 the ideas uh, also, the, the money sort of also follows the ideas. It, it, they're kind of hand in hand, basically. So that's my overall impression for what it's worth, yeah. Uh, yes. Is there any future, this is sort of second question, is there any future in um, burning coal in situ? Do you mean uh, gasification? Yes. Well, uh, interestingly, they experimented on this in the 1950s in, yeah. in Britain, uh, up in uh, Derbyshire. Mm -hmm. And it's, yeah, it seemed to be not economic as yet, but of course, our coal mining industry, it still exists. Uh, I think a, the majority of it now is surface mining rather than the, the deep mining. Um, but of course, all those mines that were closed up uh, 30 or so years ago, uh, you can't just blast the tops open again because of course the, the roads fill up with clay over time. So you'd really need to completely dig, re-dig the, the coal mines again. Really not, not practical. So that makes underground coal gasification look uh, a lot more attractive because then what you have to do, you basically um, ignite the coal under certain uh, low oxygen conditions and it basically, uh, it self pyrolyzes. The energy from the coal uh, heats up more coal and turns it into gas effectively, which you gotta get up to the surface. Um, there are also issues over safety. Um, once you sort of effectively set light to a coal seam, it's very, very difficult to stop it. And of course, coal is a supporting rock, effectively. So once you dig or you, you uh, remove the coal through gasification, then you've got a fairly good chance of subsidence uh, happening. People sometimes say, well, uh, tell me this. When they've got all that gas and, and oil out of, that, out of the ground, um, isn't there a big hole? Isn't it going to simply collapse? Well, not really, because they're contained in source rock. So the basic structure 
remains intact. So it, it's less of a likely problem. So there are various conundrums, and it's, it's, it's not considered to be economic at the moment. That's not to say that it might not become so as the, the gas and the oil prices increase. Because the gas and the oil prices have to increase, because at the moment it's too, che it's too cheap um, <coughs> to make it viable to extract and invest in more and more unconventional oil. So for example, if it costs you $100 a barrel uh, to produce oil from fracking, and you can only sell it for 50, you know, it's an absolute no-no. So a lot of the investment um, is going. A lot of the fracking companies, the smaller outfits, they're going bust at the moment. But, and what this means, because as I said, we've got this decline in the supply of crude oil already, the, uh, the regular crude oil. Um, so far, it's been possible to, to fill that hole from these unconventional sources. Now, once you can't do that, if the investment isn't going ahead now, then a year or two or three years down the line, then that oil supply is just not going to be uh, there to, to take up the slack. And so we're then going to start to see serious uh, issues o over uh, the, the overall oil supply. And that will force the price back up on a sort of supply and demand basis. The thing, of course, is when the oil price is back to $100, everybody goes, right, OK, let's get fracking again. And it's this kind of balance between uh, economics and technology. But I think a severe slowing down of that flow of oil into civilization is going to change things uh, so extremely that it won't be possible to make a knee-jerk reaction and go, right, OK, let's get fracking again. Because you've gone out of business 10 years ago, your equipment rusty, you don't have the trained personnel. It's, it's, not, it's not a seesaw. You can't just sort of react one for another. It's like trying to steer the proverbial oil. They don't know what else to do. You know, there is this model we're so familiar with. You don't quite know what else to do. Um, Chapman, please. It's all building on that. It's about, you said it's not about energy and technology. Mm. But I love it saying we can make changes. Yeah. It's not clear who we are or who you are. <laughs> so in COVID, you can say you do this, you do that, mm. or we're having this, we're having that. Actually, there are players, there are organisations of people with power, yeah. and we have some power. We're not, in a way we're talking about it, not seeing mm. who makes choices that change things. Mm. Unless we see where we each have the power to make a choice that changes something, we're just repeating theory. Yeah. So I'm interested in what are the agencies, to the, what power do we each have here? change our choices? I think we're more powerful than we are in, in, in many respects, but it needs the change in the mindset to do that. Okay, so uh, for example, um, for fun, we, we sort of had a look around at home at how we were doing things, and we managed to save about a third of our use of energy with no particular discomfort. And so, of course, if you're multiplying that by millions of people, then collectively, that could add up to, to a huge um, difference. But you've got to have the mindset to do that. But as Alan was saying, if the, the message is consume, 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 what we need is more and more growth, then nobody's thinking that way. Um, so that is, that is the, the, the change you need to have. You know, I mean, or I suppose if energy becomes so expensive that you can't afford it, then you think, oh, cut my energy use by a third, bloody hell, pay a third less on, on, the, on the bills, then that's a really strong incentive for doing it. And that could be the change, because economics uh, tends to drive the, the behaviour of individuals and, and nations and the world, ultimately. So I think that could be it. I have a horrible feeling that it's almost as though things are a bit too comfortable at the moment. You know, life is still rolling on okay, you know, we're all right, we're good enough. Uh, food, I've got some cash in my pocket, um, you know, I can get the bus back later, etc, etc. No problem. Um, but of course, if things began to change and then suddenly, you know, it really was down to May 6, then I think I'd feel an incentive to, to change my behaviour uh, quite considerably. But yeah, I think sort of generally speaking, okay, as I say, we, we did, did this f for fun, but um, yeah, I, I think it's not what horrifies me is I, I fear that it's not until things get a lot worse that anything is really going to change significantly. But by that point, of course, then we don't have so much slack in the system. Hmm. Yes? Um, just in terms of electricity generation, 
Um, and from the point of view of reducing um, uh, fossil fuel use, cutting down CO2 emissions, do you think generation by, uh, by wind energy um, could or should make a significant contribution? Mm, very controversial, isn't it, wind energy? Um, I think you need to have your turbines in, in the right place and, and so on. Um, although we, we are, if you look, there's a website. Um, you can look in real time at where the electricity is coming from. It, it slips my mind at what it is. I can certainly send you, you the link to it. And at times, you know, you can have up to about 8% of our electricity is coming from wind power, you know, under favourable conditions. Integrate that over the, the year, it's going to be less than that. But that is significant, even if it was a few percent. So, as I say, I think we're going to need an overall energy mix and renewables, and ideally an increasing level of contribution of renewables, um, is certainly going to be uh, an important part of that. Um, but yeah, the, the dig, I think where the controversy comes is where wind turbines are not put in the, the right place. Um, so there's not enough wind or there's too much, that kind of thing. But of course, these offshore wind farms, they've not been around long enough to know um, how resilient they're going to be. Because salt water has a horrendous effect on uh, mechanical uh, components. There was a, a wind farm off Ireland which basically collapsed um, because the underlying uh, geology wasn't strong enough to support the weight of it. They're damn heavy, these things, uh, the offshore ones, you know, the, the five megawatts, the, the really big ones. I mean, they're, you know, they're, they're a few hundred tonnes, I should think, each one of these. So the seabed's got to be strong enough to, uh, to take it. So there are engineering uh, issues to, to take account of as well. But, yeah, I, I think probably covering as many roofs as possible with so, solar panels is, is an easier approach. But, um, and most of the renewable energy actually is solar, followed by wind. But um, I, 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 I would put my money on solar more than wind, actually, yeah, probably. Okay. Yeah. Yes? Um, some of the sustainable water has been quite keen to cover, but they all thought that would be exhausting. Oh, okay. Is there any way they can see this online? Or uh, there may well yes, be. We yes. Have, uh, yes, we want to Just do put that. Put a link through. Yeah. 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 Just following on from what you said about uh, you know, getting to a crisis, do you see any way of uh, getting our society, mainstream society to take these issues more seriously before it becomes crisis management and you've got virtually <coughs> no options left or are we just going to hit buffers? I think the big problem um, is that you've got sort of relatively... Uh, quiet voices in terms of the number of people talking about writing about these things saying what you've just said hey you know we've really got to get it together um, while there's still uh, time to, to avert the, the worst calamity but then there is, is the very loud voice of consumerism which has a lot more money behind it and uh, I think there is a problem too that um, nobody wants to be told well you've got to do with less you know because there's a bit sort of what well, I don't really quite like that idea. Um, if you've been told consumerism for generations, mm. then it's a very, very difficult thing to do to um, mm. turn the mind in the opposite, you know, throw the switch so that the thinking goes in, in the opposite direction. So, I, as I say, my sort of horrific prospect mm. is no, you know, we, we, are, we are buggered basically. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Uh, you mentioned thorium, yeah. nuclear energy. Um, I've been involved in a group that's uh, uh, working with the victims of Chernobyl, the children whose life expectancy mm. was not very long, and having has moved me very, very tremendously. Having mm. seen what's what can happen, is there something? I mean, I can't imagine anybody. Uh, recommending nuclear and nuclear power. Is there something quite different about thorium? Uh, it is safer and it produces less nuclear waste. So it will not be 100% problem free, but it's better than the system we have. And why people are keen on it is because nuclear power is said to be um, zero carbon, well not quite, but low carbon energy. So from the climate change point of view, that's what um, stirs people up in the direction of it. But yeah, we, until we get around the nuclear waste problem, if we ever can, 
uh, there, there is always that issue. And I mean, Chernobyl sh should never have happened. I mean, they did absolutely everything wrong in defiance of all safety regulations. And yeah, they got a hole in the roof, basically. Uh, I, I, I was in Russia around the Rome that time, actually, and it was, we couldn't get any information about what had happened from our, our Russian colleagues because, you know, it was just keep quiet about it. And uh, we did discover what had happened via the old Janet uh, network, uh, the, the joint academic network, where we could uh, communicate uh, via computers with our colleagues in, in other countries. And there was a chap in Sweden told us what had happened, that uh, somebody had gone into work in the nuclear power plant in the morning, set all the alarms off, and they thought, strange, it's gone in. You, you would expect uh, the alarms to go off um, when he was walking out of work. And then they realized he was heavily contaminated. And they said, well, where have you been? And he said he'd been hiking in the hills over the, the, the last few days. And of course, he'd been contaminated by the radioactive plume that it uh, came over from, from Kiev. Um, but, I mean, they, they, they didn't call for help at all, the Russians, from anybody else, because they wanted to contain it, because it was a rather embarrassing uh, thing to, to happen. But it, it, is, it is thought in some quarters that actually Chernobyl and the example of it, and with everything else that was going on, was like the, the final nail in the coffin of the Soviet Union. Because Gorbachev was saying, well, we can't continue with this arms program. It's taking 60% of the GDP. You know, let, let, let's, let's do things differently. But uh, yeah, I, I have issues with nuclear power, but I can see why it is uh, appealing. From the, from the CO2 uh, point of view. I guess there's no... But there's also, it's very long term, mm. it doesn't address the immediate, and it's very expensive. It takes yeah. a lot of energy. Yeah. Mm. I think if they're gonna go for nuclear power, what might be the best compromise would be to go for these um, you know, generation four reactors that actually burn nuclear waste. They can burn a huge mix of things, and at least that way, rather than burying uh, what we've got already in the ground for thousands of years, you can actually destroy it and convert it into energy in the, in the, in the process. I, I can see some merits in doing that. Have they got that technology? Uh, it is being developed. You know, it's at the R&D stage. That's the story I don't think they're going to have it for 20 or 30 years, yeah. No. Right, who hasn't? Right, Woody, you haven't done that. I would just say, uh, is there anything we can learn from the Cuban experience? Ah! That's what happened yeah. the, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the mm. oil tap, the fertilizer tap, was turned yeah. off in Cuba. That's right. And went through a horrific time, but out of it came their green revolution. That's right. So, have we anything to learn? Yeah, uh, Cuba is a very interesting example. Um, you, you're probably familiar with the story, but yeah, in Cuba, when communism collapsed, Cuba used to get cheap supplies of oil and pesticides and so forth um, from the Russians, from the USSR, um, for maintaining themselves as an outpost, a Soviet outpost overlooking America, basically. Okay, so well, the, the Russians had uh, other, other problems of their own, so suddenly they didn't get these, these supplies anymore. So what they, they went through was what's called the special period, the special period during peacetime where basically they used permaculture principles and agroecology principles to grow as much food as they could. They tore up car parks and so forth. I mean, they weren't driving around. They didn't have the fuel there, for one thing. So they survived at this period. And it is said, though, that the average Cuban lost about 20 pounds in weight during this um, because they were really down to um, short rations, effectively. But they're the only country to have survived a peak oil situation. Now, time has moved on, and although they, they managed to do this, uh, the Cuban economy um, is really on the skids. Um, they're trying to encourage more investment. The Americans have dropped the sanctions against them, so they want more and more money coming in from outside. And so there's cheap food to be bought in the store on the way home, so people aren't bothering to, to grow their own food anymore. So that green revolution has kind of gone onto the back burner, at least. Yeah, it, it's interesting, the transformation in Cuba. But the model that they used certainly could be uh, used again and adapted across the world. Because, okay, a, a country of what, three and a half million people, something like that. But they managed to, to feed everybody. And that they, in Havana, 
they could grow enough um, vegetables to, to feed the population, basically, which is an incredible thing. Uh, and also, Cuba produces more doctors, more medical doctors per 100,000 of population than any other country on earth. So they held their educational system uh, together during this, this pr pr process as well. Yeah. So yeah, I think we can learn a lot from Cuba, um, both in terms of what um, they did, but also that when capitalism gets its teeth back in again, that, uh, as I say, when there is no longer the necessity to do these things, then, well, you know, hmm. Mm. Yeah, sit in the sun, exactly, yes, a lot of sunshine down there. <laughs> yeah. We went to a lecture recently at the Royal Institution on the last one year, 3 a. Um, on, I always get these uh, mixed up. Now, the atom bomb is nuclear fission? The atom bomb is nuclear fission. Right, so we went to a lecture on nuclear fusion. Uh -huh. And the wonderful international effort, I mean, it's the most... Um, <coughs> it's the thing that gave me hope. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's this enormous <coughs> in, international cooperation going on. There's a... There's, an, an element of it being developed in Oxfordshire, mm. a huge project down in the south of France, which is only on a tiny scale yeah. at the moment. But they, there is this massive international investment right across the planet mm. to try and get this working yeah. on um, a, an economic scale. And I really felt that the international cooperation that's going into that um, where it, countries as far apart as China and um, South America are each contributing a bit mm. towards this. Yeah. And I really felt that, you know, all is not lost. I don't know what your impression of this is. Yeah, uh, there's, there's a big project uh, going in the States too. <clears throat> and uh, they're, they're using a, a version of it called uh, inertial confinement fusion. And other people are working on... Uh, um, Mag magnetic containment so if you're using these tokamak uh, systems. But even if we suddenly had limitless energy, um, it doesn't solve the problem of getting through all the other resources, the soil, the water, and everything else. It's not just energy. As I said, that there is a nexus, really, between uh, our use of energy and uh, our use of water, soil, and all other resources in this very complex um, global uh, civilization that uh, we, we are in the midst of. So, yeah, I, I remember um, when I was about 10 being told that uh, fusion power would be 30 years away. Well, I'm, I'm a little bit more than that now. You know? Oh, yeah, I know it's not going to happen instantly. <laughs> but, um, yeah, okay. Um, yeah. Sorry, I, um, I just wanted to come, this is a bit of techno optimism. Mm. Though it's not contrary to what I was saying before. <clears throat> Yes, that, um, I'm still a radio listener, and yes, within the last three or four days, there's been a 45 minute Radio 4 program about exactly this, mm. this hopeful sounding state of fusion technology and this completely new mm. circular, free, um, yes. semi underground place which has been excavated mm. uh, yeah. in front. But the fusion people are saying, well, basically, we, we have done it, we yes. now have done it. <coughs> That we need the big. Um, the, the, we just haven't haven't had haven't had the scale until the space is completed. So that's how. Yeah, the main the main thing um, you have to um, you basically got to have more power coming out of these fusion reactors that you're putting in. Okay. And although this has been because that's generally what has not happened. I mean, even with inertial confinement, you need more power to run the lasers than you actually get out of the thing. And that while they have um, achieved, I think, the, the break-even point, it's only for a short time. It's not like a continuous power source, or they, they can't sort of keep on pulsing for hours or, or weeks or days. Um, so, well, I, I suspect the problem is entropy in these systems, actually. But um, nonetheless, even if it could be done, the scaling up of these and the time that we have left to do this, you know, that, that's a real limiting uh, But what issue. cheered me was the international cooperation yeah. to, to try and do something. 
Mm. I mean, you get international corporate cooperation on something like this because it's so damned expensive, an individual nation couldn't possibly go for it. But the European Commission uh, could attack something like that, um, the States of America and so on. But yeah, you, you, you do get, get these things, but it, how long would it take before the individual nations of the world have each got their, uh, their units, basically. I, I, I think it's, it's a long way off, but yeah, I, I agree, yeah. This, this, this partly, um, partly goes back at least, at least to the genesis of modern economics with, with Adam Smith, where it was convenient to assume that the earth has no value. <laughs> uh, all value is created through human alteration and manipulation and extraction of that. And this has resulted in a civilization that's taken it quite naturally. I think for most of us, <coughs> at sort of deep emotional levels, we probably feel that money and the economy is much more real than this earth of which we are. Each of us is an earthling who, mm -hmm. who has evolved through, through beautiful, beautiful unimaginably complex processes over long periods of time. And we, we, we treat the Earth as expendable. So yeah. at some point, the Earth will treat us as expendable. And wipe us off, you mean, basically. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, across um, as long, uh, as far back as people can go in terms of uh, what's happened with species on the planet. Um, species die out, don't they? Um, I think it's probably going to be an answer. Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask you the question, because not so many years ago we had a Glacier lecture which was extremely pessimistic about our future as a race, and uh, by and large your talk has been, I don't know whether optimistic is right, but you obviously tackle the whole thing as a problem solver rather than as a prophet of doom. But one of the things that has come out, for, come out of it for me is such is the need for consciousness change mm -hmm. that I sort of see that there is a real need for a spirituality which is yeah. not, um, a, you know, sort of old age spirituality, but it does seem to me that um, it's only um, as demanding a process of spirituality that can actually affect the change in consciousness yeah. for instance, to get people to consume less. And I mean, one of the things I'd love to go away and do after this lecture is sort of read up on how I can consume less. Like you, I come to Brazil by bus, so that's a good start, but um, it's a very, very puny start, isn't it? So, um, you know, if I can use if I can really monitor my developing consciousness, yeah. mm -hmm. um, I stand a much, much better chance of simply consuming less, don't I? I think most people, uh, because of the pressures of everyday life, um, they don't really have time to think about this yeah, stuff. They're just trying to up. hang on in there, basically, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the old uh, hamster wheel kind of thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Gosh. yeah. Can I just say that uh, I, I agree with uh, the last speaker. Um, it seems to me the elephant in the room is, is this the fact that uh, we're talking about replacing the energy that we won't have so that we can maintain the lifestyle that we have. That's it. Uh, yeah. No one really wants to face the fact that we have to live using less energy. No, we don't. That's right. Tell that to Donald, Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> it would be a very unpopular message. Yeah. 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 I think uh, David Holmgren that you referred mm. to talks about the scenario of living with energy descent. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, I mean, David Holmgren, he presents four energy or four sort of scenarios, doesn't he? The one he calls techno fantasy, which is where we just increase and increase our use of energy and materials and so on. Yeah, there'll be fusion power. Yeah, there'll be this. We'll find new sources of whatever. Um, then the other one, or the, 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 the opposite one of that, is Atlantis. That's basically game over, sort of collapse of population within a few years, disaster. Then there's green tech stability. 
and that's where we can more or less carry on as we do now, but we'll have more wind turbines, more biofuels and all the rest of it. And then the other one um, is basically energy descent, that's the third option. And you've used permaculture as being um, a transitional approach towards the, uh, the descent <laughs> of the pathway. And he says uh, that uh, in the future, a more realistic um, symbol of the future, rather than a solar panel, is likely to be a tree. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I've got, to, I've got to throw this one in. Where does Matt Tambora come in at all forward? Ah, yeah. Well, because we have yeah. that one. Or um, well, you know, super volcanoes like the one under um, Yellowstone Park, yes. for example. Yeah. We well, I, I, 